So I'm going to do The Disappearance and Murder of Suzanne Pilly. Lying somewhere and nobody knows. As if nobody loved her. I think we as the family should decide where she's laid to rest. I used to worry how she would survive without us, but I never thought we would have to survive without her. <laughs> It's so current that on the 4th of May, which is two weeks ago, um, police returned to Argyle in an attempt to find her body. It's exactly 10 years since her disappearance. So um, on May the 4th, 2010, the 38 year old bookkeeper vanished just a stone's throw away from her office in Edinburgh. Her disappearance sparked a huge search and then after no trace of her body was found, it became a murder inquiry. David Gilroy, her ex-lover and colleague, was charged and later convicted of her murder. He was found guilty by a majority verdict on the 15th of March 2012 and sentenced to life imprisonment. The judge ordered him to serve a minimum of 18 years in prison. The case is controversial because the prosecution obtained a murder conviction without a body. Gilroy, age 57, has never revealed the location of the body. On May 4th, 2010, um, she was making her way to the offices of Infrastructure Managers Limited in Thistle Street, Edinburgh, where she worked as a bookkeeper. As part of her routine, she'd often call into the St Andrew's Square branch of Sainsbury's on the way to work. There's a lot of detail in this because they used a lot of CCTV footage right. to find out what happened to her. Um, at 8.54am, she was seen on CCTV on North St David Street, about to turn into Thistle Street. This was to be the last public sighting of her, and she failed to turn up for work. So it's obviously like five to nine, doesn't oh. turn up. So on the afternoon, she was actually reported missing. Um, I don't know how, it, it was really quick. Presumably because she didn't turn up at work, her parents were worried, blah, blah, blah. And she was reported missing by her parents, Robert and Sylvia Pilly. I actually, further on this article, read that her father sadly passed away last year oh, without any closure. So, so it's so sad, yeah. On May the 11th, the police started a high-profile public appeal for information using screens erected in the centre of Edinburgh. They played footage of Pilly's last known whereabouts and they issued a statement saying that they believed she might have been the victim of a criminal act. On the 18th of May, her employers issued a statement saying that her disappearance was completely out of character. And the following day, the police issued a statement saying they were now treating the inquiry as a murder investigation there was no sign of her, no trace of her, she hadn't been using her credit cards, she hadn't gone online, you know, it was, it was she completely... Just, like, disappeared. She just disappeared off the face of the earth. That's so scary. So two days later, on the 20th of May, it was reported in the press that the police had expanded their investigation to a 400 square mile area of Argyll, stretching from Tindrum to Inverary and the Argyll Forest. So I think, that, you know, the rest of the thankful area would be, come into it heavily. And further um, in the investigation, I read, they came as far as Loch Gilbert, which is only, you know, an hour away an from, hour away, from yeah. Campbelltown. It was said they were, they were keen to trace the movements of a silver vehicle driven by a man on remote roads across Argyll and Butte on the mm -hmm. afternoon of 5th of May. On the 23rd of June, David Gilroy, a colleague and former boyfriend of Pilly's, was detained by Lothian and Borders Police under Section 14 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act in connection with her disappearance. Later that day, he was arrested and charged with a murder. Um, on the 24th of June, Gilroy appeared in petition. I actually looked this up because I didn't know what it meant. So what it means is the fiscal has decided that the accused should appear in petition. A petition is a legal document containing the first draft of charges against the accused in a serious case. If the accused is released on bail, any trial must start within one year of the accused first appearance in court. This is all really important because they're treating it as a, a, a really serious case and also you'll find out later because he obviously makes an appeal and the trial has to happen within a year, you know, so it's all quite relevant. At Edinburgh Sheriff Court, he is charged with the murder of Suzanne Pilly and various other offences relating to her disappearance. He makes no plea or declaration and then he's fully committed for trial. A second petition for bail was lodged and granted. Granted, they granted him bail. Why? I suppose because they had no body. It began at the High Court of Justiciary, um, which is Scotland's Supreme Criminal Court. 
Um, when sitting at first instance of the trial court, it hears the most serious criminal cases such as murder and rape. Um, a single judge hears the cases with a jury of 15 people. That's what always happens. I'm just reading that because it's Scottish law mm -hmm. and it's the High Court. Yep. The indictment ran to five pages, basically. The principal charges were that he killed, that Gilroy killed Pilly at the offices in um, Thistle Street, Edinburgh, and that he concealed her corpse um, and transported it to a guile in the boot of a car. A jury of eight men and seven women began hearing the evidence um, on the afternoon of the 20th of February. The trial lasted 24 days. The first witness for the Crown was Suzanne Pilly's mother, Sylvia Pilly. She spoke to the fact that her daughter had a turbulent on-off relationship with David Gilroy and that she'd previously cohabited with him on a temporary basis. On the 23rd of February, the Advocate Deputy led evidence from a Lothian and Borders Police Constable who told the court they had enlisted the help of specially trained cadaver dogs from South Yorkshire Police to search the offices where David Gilroy and Suzanne Pilly worked. The dogs were specially trained to smell for blood and human remains. The court was told that the dogs, Springer Spaniels, had identified three areas of interest, one in the basement area of the offices and two in the boot of David Gilroy's silver box hall bedroom. So uh, on 24th of February, the court heard from a forensic imagery expert who had analysed footage on behalf of the police. She told the court that the CCTV footage of a person on Thistle Street bore enough similarities to other CCTV images of Suzanne Pilly taken that day for her to say that it definitely was Pilly. She was 20 metres from the entrance to her work. 20 metres. Oh my God. So, yeah. And nobody's seen him. No. But then she must have entered her work because the cadaver dogs found um, scent, uh, scent in the basement. So she must have actually reached work. On the 27th of February, David Gilroy's wife was cited as a witness. She took the stand. The trial judge, Lord Brackadale, explained that she had the right not to give evidence against her husband if she did not wish. She declined to give evidence. Now, she was only able to do this because it took place before Section 86 of the Criminal Justice and Licence in Scotland Act came into force. Which actually, I, I looked it up, it came into force on the 28th of March 2011. And this case is in February 2012, but because it happened before the date, after that act came into place, um, women who were um, wives who were competent and compelable witnesses had to had to give evidence. But Absolutely, I, I can't believe it took that long. I know. On March the first, Sergeant Paul Granger of Lothian and Borders Police spoke to the contents of an 11-hour interview, which Gilroy gave to police in the second May. He told the court that during the interview he noticed a scar on Gilroy's forehead under his hairline and there had been some sort of scratch in his chin. The court also heard that Gilroy had told police that on the evening of the 2nd of May 2010 he and Pilly had decided to split up and then took part in a Buddhist style religious ceremony, writing their feelings down on pieces of paper and burning them. On the 6th of March the court heard from a forensic scientist, Kirsty McTurk, who told the trial that she had conducted a search for DNA in Pilly's workplace and the boot of Gilroy's car. She confirmed that she'd been, been unable to find any trace of Pilly's DNA anywhere in the building or in the car, even though the cadaver dogs mm -hmm. had, had found something. She told the court that as she opened the boot to Gilroy's car, she noticed a fresh smell coming from inside. She told the advocate deputy that it could either have been air freshener or a cleansing agent. Now, in my mind, she's a forensic scientist. Yeah, but why did she not then test to see what it was? Because yeah. then if it's like bleach or something, then it's like, well, what, what the hell did he have in his car? But if the, um, and, and that was also indicate there's no blood, because if there's blood, you know that blood, no matter how you clean yeah, it, yeah, still yeah. always stays. So, yeah. The court later heard from a friend of Suzanne Pilly's, Gail Hawkins, that Suzanne had previously told people she was worried that Gilroy was hacking into her email account. The QC produced phone records showing that Gilroy was in contact with Pilly almost daily before her disappearance. <sighs> but that his contact had stopped the day before she went missing. Oh my God! He texted her more than 50 times Not a day. No. Yeah, the last contact between their phones was on the 3rd of May when he left 15 text messages and one voicemail the day before she went missing. He's, he is a killer! He's a stalker, that's what he is. Please leave your message after the tone. Hi Suzanne, it's David here. Uh, give me a phone back, please. I just wanted to have a wee chat with you, um, you know, see if you needed a lift or anything. Just give me a phone back even, just for a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, I'm worried. 
On 7th of March 2012, a forensic pathologist told the jury that Gilroy had curved scratches on his hands, a cut his forehead, bruises in his chest and other scratches to his hands, wrists and forearms. A series of photographs were produced in court. Must obviously I struggle because if I was like, if you were like, you know, I'd be like scratching your arms and trying to get you off me. And... That's exactly what it says. It says possibly that being caused by another person's fingernails, possibly in a struggle. But under cross-examination, Dr. Carey confirmed that the scratches in Gilroy's hands could have come from gardening activities. Oh, for God's sake. Oh, right, let me see your arms. Oh, actually. Gardening. Gardening. And iron, the iron from my hands. Where do you iron? On the 8th of March 2012, the advocate deputy led evidence from a Lothian Borders police constable who told the court how they partially traced a car journey Gilroy made to Loch Gilded on the 5th of May 2010 using CCTV footage. After analysing the footage, police recreated the journey then back several times. They found that he'd taken two hours longer than the average time each way. A comparison of fuel consumption suggested that 124 miles of Gilroy's journey were unaccounted for. So basically, yeah, it used so somewhere within that journey, he has taken a side road. It's taken two hours and 124 miles. This is when you should get criminal minds to come in. I know the FBI because they would work it out. They'd look at the you know the logistics zone. on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, this concluded the evidence for the prosecution. The Crown withdrew a number of charges in the indictment relating to an assault, a breach of the peace and a contravention of the Computer Misuse Act. But charges 6 and 7, um, murder and attempting de to defeat the ends of justice, remained. So they basically did away with the other. I don't know why. I'm mm. sure they've got a reason for it. The defence case. So the defence case began in the morning of 12th of March and lasted half a day. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't have much to go on, did no. we? The court heard from a number of witnesses who worked in the offices of Infrastructure Managers Limited who spoke to the fact that they did not see anything out of the ordinary at the premises in Thistle Street on the 4th of May. Gilroy declined to give evidence in his own defence. Oh, shut up! I know. If you, I'm sorry, right? Say somebody accused me of being a murderer, I'd be like, honestly, it wasn't me. You would, you would be vocal about it, you'd be... Like, surely declining to, to say anything. Yeah, he's been advised to do that by his lawyer, though. But then his, his lawyer... lawyers obviously looked at everything and went... On the afternoon of 12th of March 2012, the advocate uh, began addressing the jury. He told them that uh, she had killed Pilly in the basement of her office before hiding her body in a recess. He brought his car from home, put her, Pilly's body in the boot, and the next day transported her to a lonely grave, something or girl. Um, he pointed to a sudden interruption in Pilly's life since she had vanished. He highlighted that she would no contact with anyone, there'd been no activity in her credit card, she hadn't made any arrangements for her pet fish and cat, which was so unlike her, you know. Um, I think that's definitely suspicious. Because I'm just getting pets at home. Yeah. And they're left. Yeah. Do you know yeah, what I mean? There's no way you there's would no do way that. There's no way anybody no. would do that. Um, when the QC began summing up the case, he urged the ladies and gentlemen of the jury to assess the evidence dispassionately and said that it would be unsafe to convict David Gilroy of murder because the, the case the Crown presented was a circumstantial one. <clears throat> On March the 12th, 13th, eight men and seven women were sent out to consider their verdict. They took two and a half days of deliberations um, and found him guilty by a majority verdict mm. of the murder of Suzanne Pilly and of attempting to defeat the ends of justice. Now, the reason I was talking about, you can look this up online, what's really interesting about this case as well is that um, given the high level of interest, Scottish broadcaster STV wrote to the Lord Justice General and uh, requested permission to film the sentencing and they were allowed in and they, they took the footage um, and made it freely, av freely available to broadcasters for use on the same day. Strict conditions were placed on what could be filmed and it was stipulated that the camera should focus solely on the trial judge and court staff and that Gilroy himself could not be filmed. Uh, in addition, it was reported that filming would only commence after the QC had finished delivering his plea. This, uh, because the decision not to allow filming, it uh, attracted widespread attention and comment in both the Scottish and national press. Um, it was actually the first time that cameras would be allowed to film the sentencing of a convicted person in the UK for the same day broadcast. On the 4th of May, she set out to go to work, pretty much as usual. Then she just disappeared, and the jury were satisfied.
on the evidence before them that that was because you murdered her and disposed of her body. On charge six, the charge of murder, I sentence you, as I am required by law to do, to life imprisonment. They were allowed, the journalists were allowed in the court though, and they were allowed to use live text-based communication services such as Twitter to document events as they happened. Oh my god, that's insane! Yeah, this marked only the second time that permission to use Twitter in the Scottish court had been granted. So following the sentencing, the recorded footage was analysed by staff from the Scottish court service and cleared for broadcast. Edited versions of the footage were shown on various national news programmes that day. David Gilroy continues to maintain his innocence. On the 27th of April 2012, he lodged an intimation of his intention to appeal against conviction. The appeal was rejected by the Court of Criminal Appeal. In June 2017, the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission closed their review of the case. So the case is closed, he is guilty, there will be no more appeals. Mm -hmm. Despite extensive searches, during the police investigation and after the trial, the body of Suzanne Pilly has never been found. Her remains are believed to be buried in a forest somewhere in Argyll. Initially, David Gilroy was sent to uh, Her Majesty's Prison at Edinburgh. This prison is not normally used to house prisoners who are serving life sentences, but Gilroy declined to be segregated from the general prison population. Um, he was then moved to shots following threats from fellow prisoners at Edinburgh. It was later reported that Gilroy had been attacked on his first day at shots by fellow inmates and conveyed to hospital with a broken jaw after telling other prisoners that he would be released on appeal. Aye, good. Aye. Last year, Miss Pilly's father, Rob, died, leaving police determined to find answers on behalf of her remaining family. Her family? Honestly, that's, that's actually horrible. David Gilroy's guilty verdict was a landmark one as only a handful of murder convictions are obtained without the presence of a body as evidence. Because they have just started searching again recently as well, they're asking for information. If anybody has information regarding this case, they should contact Police Scotland on 101. Or alternatively, an anonymous report can be made to the charity Crime Stoppers on 0800 treble 5 treble 1. And that is the disappearance of Suzanne Pilly. Well, it was just, it's really current and it's such a shame, it's oh, so God. sad. I remember it happening, I remember, you know, the police looking and everybody saying, oh, the police are looking for a dead body and they're way up the Oban Road and blah, blah, blah. And I had never heard anything. Yeah, you had no idea what it was all about, but now it's um, it's so sad that they never ever found her and her family, her sister and her mother continually um, look, you know, for her and, and want information about it. They're under absolutely no doubt whatsoever that yeah. he did it. Um, but he still maintains his innocence. Another thing to probably take from that is always go with your gut. Uh, if you feel like you're being stalked or you are being harassed by someone you don't know, um, you're probably right, you probably are being stalked and you probably are being harassed. And if your boyfriend is texting you 50 times a day, he's not the one for you, right? Because he doesn't need to know where you are every minute of the day. You know, so there were warning signs. I'm not saying no, it's not her fault. It's not her it's fault. Not I'm not saying she take lessons from this. Yeah.